Well, hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser, thanking you for joining me on this trip down memory lane. Now for some of you, well, you're old enough to remember when all this happened the first time around, and it should bring back a lot of wonderful memories. Now others, well, you're too young to remember when all this happened, but you should get a kick out of seeing just how far we've all come. But for everybody, young and old, hopefully at the end of this adventure, we'll all be able to look back together and say thanks for the memories. Thanks for the memory of sentimental verse, nothing in my purse, and chuckles when the preacher said, for better or for worse, how lovely it was. And how are all those little dreams that never did come true? Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I think we'd all agree that these days we live in a fast-changing technological age. Everything these days seems to be digital. But let's dial back just a little bit to a kinder, simpler time in American history. A time when people would gather together in their living rooms around a little brown box, a singing, talking box. They were mesmerized by this box. It was the golden age of radio. Cake Floor brings you Grand Central Station. Grand Central Station. Veteran actor James Caron has enjoyed a love affair with radio since he was a child. He remembers his father running into the streets of their Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania neighborhood in 1927 upon hearing news of the first transatlantic flight. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I just want you all to know I listening to my Atwater Kent radio and thank God Captain Charles Lindbergh has been sighted off the coast of Ireland and he is safe. Karen wanted to do his father one better. He started building radios in cigar boxes complete with earphones so that he could listen to baseball games. I said I'm listening to KDKA in Pittsburgh. He said come on for Christ's sake. Pittsburgh is 400 miles away. You can't listen to Pittsburgh. I was regularly at night. I could get Pittsburgh KDK. It was a very powerful station. Karen enjoyed listening to that show, along with series like Little Orphan Annie and The Green Hornet. Who's that little chatterbox? The one with pretty auburn locks. If you could be then he started putting faces with those voices. To uh, suddenly find myself sitting there with all these actors whom I had only heard and actually was always surprised at the way they looked. They always looked different than I had imagined them. <laughs> Karen recalls some memorable broadcasts, among them the infamous War of the Worlds radio program directed by legendary filmmaker Orson Welles. Even with recurring programs like Fibber McGee and Molly, the formula never seemed to get old. He would open the closet door and that great sound of everything tumbling out, a kitchen sink tumbling out, everything. But it was done week after week after week. Straighten up it, Mommy Day. Over the years, Karen has amassed a sizable collection with many standouts. I just think it's so beautiful for a lady's boudoir. And his collection is only growing in value. One radio he paid $200 for is now fetching up to $9,000 on the market. Yes, nostalgia can be a lucrative business, but for Karen, it is the origins of the medium that matter most. Nothing was there but, but a microphone and a couple of wonderful actors and your imagination. Come on, the house, quick. We'll get the boys together and we'll go after. No, I'll take the jitney into town and get my car. All right, Betty.
You know, before wrestling and cage fighting, there was another sport in America that was very popular. It was a real nail biter and took a lot of stamina too. Of course, we're talking about roller derby. And one of the biggest roller derby stars was Billy Bogash. Now, Billy owed his career in roller derby to his friend, his manager, his teammate, his mother, Ma Bogash. Four minutes, nine seconds left to go in the game. And the Panthers out in front now by one. They lead 24-23. And coming in is the great veteran of the roller derby, number 22, Billy Bogash. You might not recognize the name Billy Bogash now, but he was practically a household name in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, one of the biggest stars of the roller derby craze that swept the nation. That's the most important one. That's what kept it going, the fans. And they would be there at night before we even got on the track for autographs. Bogash is 90 now, but he'll never forget the roar of the crowds. Most skaters or entertainers are, are, let's face it, are we're corny. You know, we, they love the they love the clap and so forth. No, that's what kept them going. Bogash started skating professionally when he was just a teenager in 1935. I'm about 18 years old, 19. I was old enough to sweat, I guess, at that time. <laughs> His mother, Josephine Bogash, taught him how to skate as a child, and later she auditioned with him. My mother, when I was a little boy, she, in a wooden sidewalk, she says, now skate, me on your feet. She didn't really realize that someday we were going to be in a roller derby. After the tryouts, the promoters hired 47-year-old Josephine and rejected Billy. I went home like a fool and then forgot to tell her. Then she was wondering what happened to me, and they says, well, we sent him home. Josephine was indignant and refused to skate without her son, but Billy was hurt and scared. He didn't want to go back. And she's, no, come on, I want to go. If you don't go, I can't go. I said, okay, we went. I was the only child, so who you can argue with? And thus was born the celebrated roller derby team, Ma and Billy Bogash. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> If it wasn't for my mother, I wouldn't have made it. <laughs> the eighth and final period is underway. At first, roller derby was a marathon event. The Bogashes raced other couples for 12 hours at a time, pounding around the oval-shaped wooden track, wearing skates with wooden wheels. They each made $25 a week, good money during the Depression. They used to feed us, and a lot of them would say, if they don't pay us, we were eating. We don't have to worry. Just as the sport started to gain popularity, the whole league almost shut down after a bus crash killed 20 skaters in 1937. Bogash was devastated, but pressed on in their memory. And we says, no, we want to skate. And you know, we skated because of this. I says, those kids that got, got killed, this is what they wanted. A few years later, Ma and Billy joined a team of five men and five women and hit the big time. They drew huge crowds, especially once roller derby got on TV in 1948. Even Hollywood stars gave them the red carpet treatment. We skaters really enjoyed meeting them because uh, they were our stars, and I guess they figured we were there with uh, entertainers or stars. Billy ruled the sport for 23 years, ending his career with the Los Angeles Braves. He says the best thing about roller derby wasn't the speed, the thrilling victories, or the fame. It was the friendships. And we're all young and happy and all fun, you know. We're, we're, we said, ah, we got it made now. Billy Bogash left the roller derby for good in 1957. The following year, he married Georgia, the woman who still wears his ring. They have three kids and went on to run a successful restaurant in L.A. for almost 30 years. Yes, Billy Bogash has lived his life to the fullest, and some of the greatest moments came on eight wooden wheels, racing around in circles with his mom. I think it made a, a boy a man. <laughs> That's about the size of it. I was all boy at one time, but I think I became a man. The great skater who sells Bogash is in there, and uh, that means action will even be intensified.
You know, over 50 years ago, there were two American cowboys in this country that had the attention and the affection of just about every kid around. In fact, every afternoon, the kids would be on the edge of their seats waiting to see what was gonna happen next. One of these cowboys was made of wood. The other had a heart of gold. The cereals you like the most bring you Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Roy Rogers, the King of Cowboys, and his wife Dale Evans, the Queen of the West, were beloved by millions as hosts of the most popular variety show of the 50s. Roy Rogers starred in more than a hundred movies, almost always playing the hero. That's the dynamite wagon. We've got to get out of here. No, wait. A generation of American kids grew up idolizing Rogers, playing shoot 'em up with the Roy Rogers gun and holster set, imagining what it would be like to play fetch with Bullet, his German shepherd, or ride Trigger, his faithful horse. Roy Rogers and Dale Evans' oldest daughter, Cheryl Rogers Barnett, says growing up with the world's most famous cowboy couple did have its advantages. The old horse, we used to put four or five kids on him and ride around. He was a stallion, but he was just the most gorgeous, gentle horse. Roy Rogers bought Trigger from the trainers, and Barnett says it was love at first sight. Trigger actually started as a rental horse. He said Trigger was like the third one that he got up on, and that was it. At that point, his name was Golden Cloud, and he had just been ridden by Olivia de Havilland in Ventures of Robin Hood. Not many people know that Trigger actually had a stunt double. There were two Triggers. The old horse, who did all the running scenes and looked magnificent and was that beautiful golden Palomino that we all remember. Then there was little Trigger, who did the rodeos, and he did all the dances and stuff. And he's the horse that you see in Son of Pale Face in bed with Bob Hope. When Trigger died, Rogers just couldn't bear to bury him, so he had the horse stuffed and mounted. Mom says, oh, you can't do that, and you know the Bible and dust to dust and all of this, and how about when you die if I just have you mounted? And Dad said that would be great as long as she put him up on trigger where he would be waving to the people. It became a family joke that became public later. Every time Dad would walk by the window with trigger in it, he would get teary. I mean, he just absolutely loved that horse. Trigger is now part of the exhibits at the Roy Rogers Museum in Branson, Missouri. It still has Trigger, Buttermilk Bullet, Nellie Bell, costumes, Dad's guns, pictures. Dad kept everything. When you go see the museum, you see their lives, but you also see things representative of the 40s and 50s and what we grew up with. I mean, it's just real nostalgia. The nerve of some people. You're really riding far or far. Oh, I don't think so. Of all the nerves, you may think that you're clever. But Barnett hopes her parents will be remembered as a decent, clean-cut, all-American couple, on screen and off. They really did stand for American values and family, God, and country. Okay, Trigger, let's ask her real nice. It cost them dearly. It cost them an hour variety show on ABC. ABC fired them when they refused to um, do away with their salute to God and country at the end of their show. Roy Rogers was born Leonard Sly, but he took the stage name Rogers to honor his hero, actor and philosopher Will Rogers. One thing we do in California is welcome. We'll welcome anything will come here. Roy and Dale raised nine kids, five of them adopted, including Barnett. Her first job was answering her dad's fan mail. Oh, it was incredible. He got 
bags of it constantly. So what was the secret to Roy Rogers' success? Why, he was just charming, and he loved what he was doing, and it came across to people. I, he was extremely athletic and a great musician and a really good-looking fellow. Wait till I get underneath the western skies With the yucca and the sage all around and it was a winning combination. A winning combination for a superstar and a dad. I'll get her beneath that good old Indian sign. Wait till I get my sunshine in the moon. Her desert home is filled with memorabilia from her dancing days in Hollywood, but Velma Dawson, who still looks great in her 90s, is probably best known as the creator of Howdy Doody. that is soft that hardens, that's what it is. I have to go and get the can. Comes in a can, I come in a can. Years ago, I saw a charming little show in Olivetta Street in Los Angeles, and it was a puppet show. I fell in love with the media, so I went home and I told my mother, I said, I want to learn how to make puppets. And uh, she said, oh, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. Don't bother with that stuff. So anyway, I uh, learned how to make puppets, uh, just in spite of her. And uh, that's how I got started making puppets. I had my own little puppet show at home. And uh, I, I, I did a lot of shows. And I finally got so that I was able to uh, get money for it, give, give puppet shows. So that's how I started. The man who hired Velma to create Howdy was Norm Blackburn. And he uh, was a supposedly good friend of mine. Uh, but he wanted to be a big shot. So he hired me to make a puppet. Or would I make it? I said, oh, sure, I'll make a puppet for you. And he hired me for $300 to make Howdy Doody. And later on, he apologized. He said, I sure sold you cheap. How did she learn puppet making? It was my love for puppets that uh, made me uh, learn how to make them and uh, manipulate them. And I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> Velma's first rendition of Howdy hit the mark. So I started modeling this face, which was Howdy Doody. Modeling, I showed it to him, and he said, that is perfection. Velma's made many puppets over the years and sometimes brings them out to entertain. Now, what would you like me to do? Sing? So where's Howdy now? My Howdy, the original one, is in the Smithsonian Institute. What does Howdy mean to her? Oh, I'm very proud of him, and he's been kind to me. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he turned out to be so famous. Shortly after this interview, Velma passed away, but she and her creation, Howdy Doody, will be with us always. And talk about going back in time. How would you like to be able to drive into a service station and get gas for 24 cents a gallon? And in addition to that, you'd get all kinds of free gifts and goodies just for being there. And on top of that, your car would literally be swarmed with attendants. People doing everything from checking under the hood to checking the air pressure in the tires. They'd even clean your windshield for you. All of this just for saying, Fill her up.
Back in the 50s, gas stations weren't simply about gas. They really put the service in service station. Service was a big thing. If you had good service, that was the biggest draw. Jim Reifer should know. He bought a signal gas station in 1957 in San Gabriel, California, when he was just 20 years old, and ran it for eight years. That's when he started a massive collection of gas station memorabilia, a small portion of which fills his sunny backyard in Diamond Bar, California. Reifer's got thousands of items, all kinds of signs, old license plates, even the stamp collecting games families used to play for prizes. There was a, a stations on every corner, and everybody, would, that's why they were given blue chip stamps, they would be give glasses, they would give, oh, all kinds of gimmicks to get you to buy gas. But Reifer's specialty is antique gas pumps. They would put these on the, the uh, like in front of a drugstore. There was a street pump. They only they had no service stations. They just had them on the curb. This is the first electric pump there was, and this is the late 20s. You'd pump it up. It'd pump up 10 gallons. Then you would re release those. If you come in and ask if you want five gallons. You'd put the, the hose in your car, and you'd pull this up, and you'd leave it down to five gallons, and then stop it. Soon they started putting ads on the pumps. That's a Bowser gasoline pump. It's electric. This is a, in the late 40s and 50s. And then we had a thing on the top had spinning with four star on it. By the 50s, service stations had sprung up on every corner. The, the going price was between 25 and 28 cents. When the gas water would come, sometimes it would go down to 24 cents, 23 cents. Back then, a gas war had nothing to do with the Middle East. Supply was not a problem. So stations fought for customers. A clean cut image was key. We had to wear a uniform with khaki uniform, khaki pants, khaki shirt, of course with the name of the station on it and their name. Clerks didn't hide behind bulletproof glass like they do nowadays. People would come in, they would ask for the gas, we'd put the gas in, check their water, oil, and battery, wash all the windows. We washed all the windows at that time. And if they wanted their tires checked. Reifer looks back fondly on the days when you got to know your customers, trusted them like friends. I'd run a, a cab and like on Fridays, they would be in and pay their bill. But by 1965, Reifer got tired of the low profit margins and high stress. But no, it was not easy. If you made $20 a day, that was something. So he started selling ice and later became a general contractor. Jim and his wife Judy have been married for 34 years. Jim just retired at the age of 70 and he's thinking about opening up an antique shop in a renovated Victorian in Hemet, California so he can share his amazing collection with the world and reminisce about the way life used to be. No doubt about it, Americans definitely had a love affair with their cars, especially American teenagers. They loved to drive around in their cars. It was a way to impress their friends. They could also use their cars to go out on dates. This was an era of car clubs and drive-ins. It's one of the oldest in the country. Thousands of films have been seen here by more than a million people in the last 70 years. 1954, we opened up the Smith's Ranch Drive-In in 29 Palms, California. The admission was 50 cents per person. The first movie was Man with a Golden Arm, Frank Sinatra. Art's dream for the drive-in started many years ago. Well, I used to go to a drive-in when I was a young youngster and I thought it'd be a great thing to play with, so I built one. So he did right here at Smith's Ranch Drive-In in 29 Palms. Memories of him in the projection booth every night while his wife sold tickets. So we had the base going in out here, and all the young Marines kind of liked to come to the drive-in. 
We felt we were giving them entertainment and they were giving us the business. And they were also on the receiving end. Back in the 50s, drive-ins were big business, raking in most of their profits from the oh-so-popular snack bar. It's intermission time, folks, so hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right over to our refreshment center for the most extravagant array of refreshment goodies ever assembled under one roof. The intermission trailers, says Clemens, were invented to increase sales between films. So why do people still like coming to the drive-in? They like the freedom of being out and uh, being in the fresh air and being able to drink a beer if they want without being pestered and they can keep it kind of quiet. The intermission videos were, they were great for business in the snack bar, but some reason or other, we don't get them anymore. But it, the film companies used to furnish them. And they used to furnish those speakers that you had to pull into your car and hang onto the window. But those, too, are gone. Oh, you always had problems with speakers, people pulling them off and uh, tearing them up. Accidentally, of course. They, you know, they go to pull off, and they got it in their window, and it sometimes it'd break their window. Well, we used to have uh, two speakers on a post. Unfortunately, why we got rid of them when uh, radio sound came out, which made it a lot more convenient to run a drive-in. Now you just tune your radio in on whatever frequency that the theater puts out, because people can get better sound from their radio than we could produce on the little four-inch speakers. Though only several hundred drive-ins remain in operation today, Clemens believes they're making a comeback. I believe they're gonna make a big comeback because people are wanting to get out of the house, get away from the TV, where they can just feel, feel free again. In the mid-1950s, America was madly in love with the automobile. A new interstate highway system was paved from coast to coast. Families stopped in the local drive-ins and ate a full meal without leaving their cars. The drive-in theater was a popular date night destination, but no one loved their cars more than America's youth. Car clubs sprouted up all over the country. We were kind of a social group that worked with our cars and tried to um, customize them, make them look attractive. Bob Stevenson was a member of the Coachman, a car club formed in Norwalk, California. It was a group centered around their cars and the artistic customizations they would perform. My car, 56 Chevy, bought a brand new. We all started out basically uh, lowering your cars down real low. You'd go to the local muffler shop and heat the springs and your car would drop and that was it. And then some guys would go extreme, take the door handles off, shaving them, they called it, have secret places to open up their uh, doors. And, uh, and some of them went to extreme of, of having the chop tops on them. You wanted to be, have attractive cars and to attract the girls. That's basically what it was. Bob and his friends proudly showed off their cars at a local hotspot. Our hangout basically was a local drive-in theater in Norwalk, which is the clock drive-in. And uh, we'd spend the evenings there and uh, hang out and talk and uh, things like that. And then the car house would come out and serve you and uh, eating french fries and gravy and cherry Cokes. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Having the best looking car wasn't always enough for the coachman. We go to the Santa Ana drag strip, and which is now John Wayne Airport. You could enter your car for five bucks, and you could race against another guy, and they'd give you a little piece of paper of what your speed was in a quarter mile, and paint a number on your car window, and then you'd just leave it there all week because man, I want I want drag racing because my number is still on there. The coachmen were not ones to shy away from hijinks. Every time you get a new member, we'd initiate them. In my case, I had to run down the street, Firestone Boulevard in Norwalk, and uh, to the All-American Market, 
and run through there and say the British are coming, the British are coming, and then run back through the, to the clock drive-in, which is about a half a mile down the road, and do the same thing. Bob's Club had their share of fun, but they did help out in the community and were even sponsored by the local Junior Chamber of Commerce. We were legitimate. We, we actually did things for the community. Uh, the only one that really put on a nice car show. And uh, we did this at the high school during the summer and we'd charge admission and then we'd have uh, trophies and uh, prizes and so forth. The coachmen branded themselves with specialty plaques bolted onto their cars and their exclusive custom jackets. It's just like nowadays the guys wearing their Harley jackets, you know, and their Harley gear. It, it was prestige. The car club only existed in the 50s for about four years as its members transitioned into starting their own families and full-time careers. Bob recalls that period as one of the most important and most fun in his life. In my single life, it was probably one of the, the most highlighted thing, uh, activity. You get to be more, uh, you might say, independent from your family. And uh, you have a job, and you can have the car, and you can come and go as you please. And you hang out at the drive-in. We belong to a car club, and uh, we're uh, cool guys. Not bad guys, but cool guys. You know, I don't think we could end this adventure without pointing out some of the individuals who made the greatest generation so great. Retired Sergeant Major Ray Wilburn. He fought in World War II, and then he fought in two additional wars. Sergeant Major, we salute you. Born July 1, 1919, on a cotton farm near Wolf City, Texas, Ray V. Wilburn would not really know poor until 10 years later, when the Great Depression struck the nation. That was the same year his father died, leaving his mother to care for 10 children alone. I used to kid everyone, we were so poor that we all slept in the same bed, and I tried to be the last one in bed at night so I could sleep on top of the pile. After years without work, Wilburn, like so many others, decided to enlist in the armed forces. He chose the Marines. So I hitchhiked 75 miles to Dallas, Texas, didn't have a dime in my pocket, and joined the Marine Corps. There was 13 of us, showed up at the recruiting station at the same time. They only took two of us. By the time World War II broke out, Wilburn had already made the rank of sergeant. And on his 23rd birthday, Wilburn was shipped off with his battalion to Guadalcanal. Utilizing their traditional skill and knowledge from ship to shore, Marines had driven a wedge deep into the Central Pacific. They told us to take three meals. We'll hit the island and we will move on. It didn't work like that. Days later, we were still on the island, and uh, unfortunately, if you run into uh, a deceased Marine, the first thing you did, you went into his pack and you got his food out, because you had to survive. Now living in 29 Palms, California, more than 60 years later, Wilburn can reminisce fondly about his life spent in active duty and wartime. They had K rations. Uh, we called them beef and grease. Bread was out of the question. You had crackers. You had to soak them in water before you could eat them. That's how tough they were. You would take that, that can and you take your, your uh, fork and uh, knife and you would stir that up and um, you, you could heat it because it was vicious cold. 
You didn't get the same thing each time. Uh, I guess they, they wanted to surprise you when you opened it, and sure enough, they did. Those who didn't like one had something to deal with and swap for the other one. I traded uh, my cocoa for coffee. Uh, being a country boy, I was born and raised on coffee. You, you had no set time to eat because you ate and run, if you will. Sweets, you didn't have them and you craved them. Most people like sweets. And when we got that, that was fighting material. You, you guarded that with your life. The food may have been lean, but communication was scarce. Nothing like the cell phone calls and video conferencing offered to soldiers today. But for the era, victory mail, known as V-mail, was highly technical. Letters from home. Each day, millions of them are sent to American servicemen fighting on distant battlefronts. Because of a war postal system called V-mail, they can be flown throughout the world, reaching distant points safely and with amazing speed. This plane is landing in Italy. Each bag of mail it carries contains 136,000 letters. Back in America, each letter was reduced to a tiny strip of film. In the interest of not taking up space, which was very precious going and coming, so the uh, letters uh, were, were very small. Every unit had a censoring officer and uh, you would write a letter on one side of the writing paper and uh, you would fold it and turn it into the to the uh, officer and he would read it and if there was anything in it that should not be there he would take a razor blade and he would cut it out then he would seal it then he would mail it even with the strict regulations and limited writing space mail call was still a not to be missed event you didn't have to be called a second time. Everyone congregated, no specific place, and uh, mail would be passed out. So many people gathered around, the first person in the line, he would get the mail and he would keep passing it back until it got to the individual. Maybe a guy that was his buddy was from the same state or could be from the same hometown. They, he would discuss what was going on to keep him abreast to, to kindly uh, boost his morale when he didn't get in the mail. Wilburn would receive orders to Korea in 1951 and to Vietnam in 1967. Sometime in the midst of his active duty, the dedicated Marine found time to marry Irma, with whom he would raise two children. On March 4th, 1971, 31 years, four months, and 15 days in the Corps, Wilburn was medically retired as the 29 Palms Combat Deployment Force Troop Sergeant Major, a lifelong Marine who knows the meaning of comrade. We all supported each other. We, we had to. We were all we had was each other. We stuck together. We shared everything. Uh, we didn't have anything, but we shared it anyway. You eat together, you sleep together, uh, you, you live together, and yes, you die together. Sergeant Major Ray Wilburn truly exemplifies the Marine Corps motto, always faithful, more commonly known by the Latin term, Semper Fi. Well, I sure hope you've enjoyed this journey back in time as we've reminisced and remembered the good old days. I've had a lot of fun. I hope you have too. Thanks for the memories. Thanks for the memory of sentimental verse. Nothing in my purse and chuckles when the preacher said, for better or for worse, how lovely it was. And how are all those little dreams that never did come true? Thank you. Thank you so much.